Welcome everyone to the first live event of Ashwilat Concerts new season. Tonight marks the start of a new series of talks which we will host on Fridays at 5.30pm in the run-up to each of our concerts this season. We will be exploring the music, the composers and the performers involved in our series in an attempt to bring you behind the scenes and ever closer to this wonderful musical world that we inhabit. This Sunday at 4pm we will be performing Tchaikovsky's epic piano trio in A minor. And so this evening we're going to explore that piece and a few of the relationships that were central to Tchaikovsky writing it in the first place. First though, I want to read from a letter Tchaikovsky wrote to his benefactress, Nadezhda von Meck, in November 1880. You ask why I am not writing a trio. Excuse me, my friend. I would like to please you immensely, but this from above my strength, the fact that due to the structure of my acoustic apparatus, I absolutely cannot stand the combination of a piano with a violin or solo cello. These sonorities seem to me to be mutually repulsive to each other, and I assure you that it's pure agony for me to listen to some trio or sonata with violin or cello. I do not undertake to explain this physiological fact, and I only state it. But what is this unnatural combination of such three individuals as a violin, cello and piano? The dignity of each of them is lost. Singing and warmed by a wonderful timbre, the sound of a violin and cello seems to be a one-sided dignity next to the king of instruments. And this latter tries in vain to show that the piano can sing like his rivals. In my opinion, the piano can appear only under three conditions. Number one, on its own. Number two, in a fight with the orchestra. Or number three, as an accompaniment, that is, as a background for a picture. But the trio implies equality and homogeneity. And where is it in between the solo instruments on the one hand and the piano on the other? She's not there. And that's why in the piano trio, there is always some kind of artificiality. And each of the three incessantly plays, not what is really characteristic of the instrument, but what is imposed on it by the author. I give full justice to art and the ingenious ability to overcome these difficulties of composers such as Beethoven, Schumann or Mendelssohn. I know that there are many trios with excellent quality music, but as a form, I do not like the trio and therefore I cannot write anything warned by true feeling for this sound combination. It is impossible when, at the mere recollection of the sonority of the trio, I simply experience a physically unpleasant sensation. <laughs> so, hearing all of this, the obvious question becomes, how on earth did Tchaikovsky ever come to write a piano trio? And when he did finally do so, how successfully was he in overcoming the inherent weaknesses of the piano trio he so eloquently describes in that letter? To answer the first question, I want to explore two relationships that were crucial to Tchaikovsky's success. His friendships with Nikolai Rubinstein and the Dejda von Meck. Tchaikovsky was born into a relatively affluent family in the Ural Mountains, 600 miles east of Moscow. His father was a mining engineer and managed the local metalworks. And although he demonstrated prodigious musical talent, there doesn't seem to have been any prospect of Tchaikovsky pursuing a career in music. Instead, he was educated at a boarding school, the School of Jurisprudence in St. Petersburg, and trained to be a civil servant. Upon graduation, he dutifully started work as a clerk in the Ministry of Justice. So what happened? His earliest compositions were reportedly written when he was just four, 
and he often improvised. Throughout his childhood, Tchaikovsky found solace in music. He was said to have been traumatised by being sent to boarding school, finding the separation from his mother particularly difficult. And this became all the more acute when she died a few years later, when Tchaikovsky was just 14. Even though his early professional life was office work, his social life revolved around music. And when the newly formed Russian Musical Society started a harmony class in 1861, Tchaikovsky enrolled. Once that organisation morphed into the St. Petersburg Conservatory a year later, Tchaikovsky was one of the first students. Tchaikovsky studied orchestration and composition with Anton Rubinstein, and upon graduating at the end of 1865, Rubinstein recommended Tchaikovsky to his conductor and pianist brother, Nikolai, as a teacher of harmony for his new branch of the Russian Musical Society in Moscow, which would shortly thereafter become the Moscow Conservatory. Tchaikovsky moved to Moscow to take up his post, and Nikolai became instrumental in championing the young composer's cause. Between 1866 and 1880, Nikolai Rubinstein conducted almost all of Tchaikovsky's orchestral premieres. His efforts were appreciated by Tchaikovsky, but there's, there was not always the easiest of relationships. Rubinstein was not afraid to criticise Tchaikovsky's work, and similarly, Tchaikovsky was not afraid in tempering his gratitude towards his musical champion. To give you a flavour of how they corresponded, here is an extract from a letter Tchaikovsky sent Rubinstein in 1878. I received your letter today. Your tone might have angered me if I had not told myself you were guided by motives for my good. Unfortunately, you see good where I and some people see evil, where I would find nothing but fruitless and aimless worries. Everything that you write to me and how you write to me proves to me that you know me very badly, as I had occasion to notice many times before. However, later in that same letter, Tchaikovsky says this. Now, let's move on to the area where you really are my benefactor. Being completely mediocre in conducting, I certainly never have, would have made a name for myself if I had not such an excellent interpreter at hand as you. If you were not in Russia, then I would be doomed to eternal distortions. You are the only person who knew how to sell my work face to face. I expect and ask you now for my opera and symphony, for with the same amazing ability, without postulating things in advance, by the incomprehensible power of instinct to learn and perform a new and difficult work in two rehearsals. Needless to say, on learning of Rubinstein's premature death from tuberculosis in March 1881, Tchaikovsky was devastated. Here was his greatest musical ally in Russia, who had given him his first musical post, who had even welcomed him to stay in his own home when he moved to Moscow, suddenly gone. Perhaps in tribute to Rubinstein's pianism, perhaps, as we will hear in deference to his benefactress, Nadezhda von Mech, Tchaikovsky decided to write his epic trio as his musical monument in memory of his friend. The trio bears the dedication to a great artist in his memory. So who was Nadezhda von Mech and how did she get mixed up with Tchaikovsky? Well, she was the widow of a railway engineer who had made millions through the explosion of railway construction throughout Russia. After her husband's death, Nadezhda withdrew completely from society in 1876. Throughout childhood, she had developed a passion for music, and she became a major benefactor for the arts, even before her husband's death. She hired Claude Debussy as a tutor for her daughter's musical education, and in 1877 she began a correspondence with Tchaikovsky, having become an admirer of his work through Rubinstein. 
She began commissioning works before eventually agreeing to provide him with a generous allowance of 6,000 roubles a year. Strangely, their relationship was based on the understanding that they would never meet, and instead, over a 13-year period, they exchanged 1,200 letters, at times sharing incredibly intimate details with one another. Certainly by the time Tchaikovsky turned his attention to the trio, von Meck was a major influence in his life, and someone who could command his attention if she asked for a piano trio. So perhaps it should come as no surprise then that a little over a year after he had initially written to her to dismiss her request out of hand, Tchaikovsky wrote this. Do you know, my dear, what I begin to write? You will be very surprised. Do you remember that once you advised me to write a trio for piano, violin and cello? And do you remember my answer? And suddenly now, in spite of this antipathy, I decided to test myself in this kind of music. I have already written the beginning of the trio. I don't know whether I'll finish it, but I would very much like to successfully finish what I started. I hope that you will believe me when I say that the main reason, or better, the only reason why I have come to terms with the combination of piano and strings that I hate so much, is the thought that I will please you with this trio. I will not hide from you that I have to make an effort on myself in order to put my musical thoughts into this new, unusual form. But I want to emerge victorious from all difficulties, and the constant thought that you will be satisfied encourages and inspires me. A few weeks later, he continued, Do not think, dear friend, that I tire myself with composing a trio. At first I had to make some effort on myself to come to terms with a combination of instruments that defied my hearing. But now this work interests me and amuses me, and the thought that the trio will give you pleasure gives this activity a great charm. By this point, it seems Tchaikovsky unleashed something in himself. The combination of wanting to pay tribute to his friend while simultaneously repay his benefactress's generosity resulted in a frenzy of activity, and the first draft of the trio was completed quite quickly in a few weeks in January of 1882. On completing it, he said, Now that the thing is written, I must say I am quite sure that this composition has not turned out at all badly. My only concern is that I may have left it too late to try my hand at this new sort of chamber music, and that some aspects of my writings for orchestra will show themselves. In short, I am unsure whether this is really symphonic music, just arranged for a trio, rather than being specifically designed for them. I took great pains to avoid this, but I don't know that it has turned out this way. So let's turn to the music itself and walk through the piece. It's 50 minutes long, so sadly we don't have the chance to explore every note this evening. But if we walk through the piece, I know you will want to tune in on Sunday and tell all your friends to do the same. The piece is conceived in A minor, which is a key known for being very tender and perfect, really, for the reflecting on the loss of a loved one. It starts after a short piano undulating introduction with the mournful first theme presented in the cello and then the violin. Let's take a listen.
Shortly afterwards, the roles are reversed and the cello takes on the role of accompanist, allowing the piano to ruminate on this stunning melody. Tchaikovsky then breaks this theme apart and interjects almost playful sixteenth notes, first in the violin and then later the piano. After that, things quickly gather momentum and a huge crescendo builds towards the bell-like second theme of the piece, which first appears in the piano. Now, as I say, I'm not going to take you through every note of this piece, but there are a few other features of the first movement I want to draw your attention to. Especially in the context of Tchaikovsky's feeling towards piano trios in general, and his own attempt at overcoming these obstacles, as he so eloquently described in his letter. A little later in this first part of the first movement, Tchaikovsky casts all three instruments in rhythmic unison and somehow creates a texture that seems so much grander and bigger than the scale of the sum of its three parts. Listen to these peals of bells that come at the climax of the second theme. <laughs> after there is a turning point that you might like to listen for on Sunday. You might have noticed that most of the melodies we've heard so far descend. The notes start high up and then come down and just at this at the end of the exposition of the first movement you'll hear there's a, a, a passage where suddenly things start to rise and that, that We'll just give you a little preview of now. These rising passages eventually build to a huge climax before things wind down and we can start the central section of the first movement, the development. This is where all the material we have heard so far is broken apart and explored. The violin and the cello play against each other and things get busier and busier before, again, there is a pivotal transition before we hear something entirely new. One of the remarkable things about this piece is 
just how many different styles Tchaikovsky manages to assimilate into one piece of chamber music. And in this next act, extract, you will hear how the strings suddenly become singers in a glorious, almost operatic duet. The piano also takes a turn at the tune in this section before the energy finally dissipates completely, paving the way for the return of the opening material. In this final chapter of the first movement, what we call the recapitulation, the music revisits the opening material, but it's always transformed. And the idea is now that you're familiar the composer can subtly alter how he presents the material to make the emotional impact even more powerful. Listen to how Tchaikovsky revisits the opening theme. It's presented at a slower tempo and the performers are told to perform it in a grief-stricken state. Powerful stuff. And when we get to this last third of the first movement on Sunday, try and compare the familiar material from the beginning of the movement and hear how Tchaikovsky has subtly altered it. We're going to fast forward now to the end of the movement to hear how he brings this monumental opening movement to a close. After revisiting the operatic theme, the violin introduces a simple descending figure and the cello joins before the piano enters with a haunting and very slow final melodic statement.
Tchaikovsky described this piece as having only two movements, but it's more useful to listen to it like it has three. We're going to look now at the theme and variations that follows. The mood is completely transformed. It's as if after the initial wave of grief, Tchaikovsky has space to remember fondly the best attributes of his friend. Here's the theme, first of all, presented in the piano in the wonderfully warm key of E major. Variation one takes that theme into the violin with commentary from the cello. The cello then takes over the melody for variation two, upping the tempo just a little in the process. Meanwhile, you will hear the violin darting around in a virtuosic counter melody above. For variation three, it's the piano's turn to shine in a brilliant scherzo. It's that moment at any funeral where, to everyone's surprise, the eulogy manages to make the entire congregation laugh. <laughs> Once we get to variation four, Tchaikovsky uses all three instruments together to weave a much richer texture. And I'm going to play you just the end of that variation where the violin gets to soar in the most incredible way. Next, we have another different set of bells from the piano with just the simplest pulsing accompaniment from the strings. Suddenly, for variation six, out of nowhere, Tchaikovsky manages to summon the image of a ballroom in a glorious waltz. Sounds like this. And if you're wondering how this waltz relates to the original theme, don't worry, he manages to include that a little later too.
Variation 7 returns to the idea of bells, and this music almost reminds me of Mussorgsky in the piano writing, with pretty simple interjections from the strings. Next comes, believe it or not, a fugue. It's like Tchaikovsky is trying to cram every possible genre of composition into one piece. Here he uses the notes from the theme as the fugue subject and then each of us gets our turn to play it. Variation 9 takes the form of a lament with flowing yet static accompaniment in the piano and the strings are muted in their own haunting melody. The piano gets another turn in the limelight next for the penultimate variation and this time it's in the form of a mazurka. He's really not leaving anything out. And this perhaps reveals Tchaikovsky's own love of dance. Now, we are conceiving of these variations coming to a close at the end of Variation 11, which returns to the theme and shares it between the violin and the piano. At the end of this variation, the music dissolves into almost nothing and it settles on a chord of E major, the dominant, perfectly preparing our ears for the finale and the return to the original key. The finale itself is entitled the Variation Finale and Coda, and Tchaikovsky originally conceived of this as being the last of the variations, but his performer friends convinced him to insert more of a break to make this into more of a last movement. In fact, they even persuaded him to authorise a cut which we will be observing that, if anything, makes the structure of the whole piece work even better. Here's the opening material of the finale. pretty celebratory and robust stuff and Tchaikovsky uses this second theme 
to contrast with what you've just heard. Now, after exploring all of this, Tchaikovsky manages to create a huge climax from which the original theme from the very opening of the piece suddenly reappears. After an epic statement of that desperately powerful melody, the music finally loses energy for good. And the final section is in the form of a funeral march with fragments of melody from the strings. And it gradually gets quieter as the procession disappears into the distance. It's strange in a way that for such a monumentally virtuosic piece, with so many enormous climaxes, Tchaikovsky chooses to just allow it to melt into silence. Now, I hope you've enjoyed this little walk through a monumental piece of music, but I hope even more that I've whetted your appetite enough to come back on Sunday at 4pm for the real live performance. As many of you know, we did a number of these live streams in the spring and they were very much a homemade productions. So we spent the time over the summer investing in some more robust technology and I hope what you've seen this evening gives you a little taste of what's now possible. We can use these different camera angles that we have, you can see one just over my shoulder here, um, to bring you closer to what's going on inside the chamber ensemble and steer your ears a little bit about what we'd like to highlight in the score. Now we had of course hoped that by this stage we would be able to welcome people back to in-person events we continue to work extremely hard on making that happen as and when, we, as and when it's possible. Um, but right now we are relying on your generosity to keep this program alive. So if you've enjoyed tonight's talk, please consider making a donation. You can donate online on our website at shwilatconcerts.org. You'll find a big orange button. And all of
of the money that we can raise, we are planning to invest in making sure that our extensive outreach programme continues to reach thousands of children one way or another this year. If you're joining us for the first time, you might like to know that alongside our season of concerts and talks, what we would normally do is take the musicians and the music from the concert platform into classrooms to play to thousands of children in the week before each concert. And we normally present that music with some educational messages. We're not afraid to share with the kids that when we start these pieces, especially a piece as big as the Tchaikovsky, it's a bit of a struggle. And those first few days in the practice room feel pretty hard work, not unlike the first time a child is introduced to a new concept. And we've been exploring that with the kids for about 18 months or so, and we're excited to see what we might be able to do digitally right now until such time as we can get back in front of them in person. Now, if you've got any questions and you'd like to join me afterwards, I will very shortly be hosting a Google Meet and I will post details of how you can get access to that in the live chat of YouTube and Facebook right now. So I hope you've enjoyed this talk and more importantly, I hope you're enthusiastic enough to tell all of your friends and family, no matter where they are in the world, to join us at 4 p.m. Eastern on Sunday for this incredible Tchaikovsky piece alongside Haydn's Gypsy Rondo. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. <laughs>